us. Overwhelm us in this meeting. Breaking the shackles of darkness that brings ignorance. Breaking the shackles of darkness that leads again and again into sin as though sin is yet in charge. Lord, cause the beams of Calvary to burst on us here today. Lord, help us to see beyond the veil. Help us to see beyond the smoke that has engulfed the mercy seat. Let your light flash around us that we may see your mercy just the way it is. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. I'd like you to turn your Bibles again with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 2. We were looking at that passage of the Bible in the morning. And I still want to push it a bit. Trust in the Lord again to give to us such help that our hearts need so much at a time like this. Are you there? I'm going to read from verse 1 as I read in the morning. And I just want to show to you the power of mercy over sacrifice. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, Many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man does speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before all before them all insomuch that they were amazed 
and glorify God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. I like to read that verse 12 in the Amplified Translation. And I just want you to take note. And he arose at once and picked up the sleeping pad or mat and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and recognized and praised and thanked God, saying, We have never seen anything like this before. May the Lord bless this word in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Permit me also to read before I start to discuss um, just about two passages as quickly as possible. One is Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, and then the other one will be St. Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. Matthew 9, Are you there? Permit me to give it a context because I'll be speaking into this this time and I'm not sure whether I'll be able to conclude it now. I might still come back tomorrow to push it. I'll start from verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that minute I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance can I seek your permission to read chapter 12 and let's see a return of that same statement as Jesus brought it forth again. I will read this from verse 1 and then we'll go back to Mark chapter 2 and we start therefrom. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was unhungered, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law 
how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this minute, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. May the Lord bless this word in our hearts in the name of Jesus. The supremacy of mercy over sacrifice. The supremacy of mercy over sacrifice. In the morning, we began to look at the book of Mark, chapter 2. We saw that as Jesus returned home, where he had his house, we don't know whether he built it or rented it. Either way, we saw Jesus as a very strategic personality. We saw Jesus as a man with great foresight. We saw Jesus who will not do anything just anyhow. He understood his calling. He understood where God was taking him. Either he built this house or he rented it. We saw that that house had a very large sitting room and it was well furnished with a lot of chairs. So much so that when people came to his house, they had enough seats for them, enough chairs to sit upon. And the whole place was packed full that even to stand at the door, there was no chance. And here were these four brothers with a friend who had this paralysis. And it's been like that. And his case had become so bad that they became desperate. Now that Jesus has entered Capernaum, and we don't know when he will leave, and he may leave the following morning, and nobody can tell when he will return. Now that he's around, we must seize this opportunity to get help for our, our friend. And you know, when they could not access Jesus, they located where he was. And then they climbed the roof. They removed the iron sheets. And they broke the ceiling. Right where Jesus was. And I'm sure you remember we said, you might have gone to places and you might have paid very great prices. And when you uncover the place, only to find out that it leads to a toilet. It could be that it leads into the kitchen, where men just take advantage of you, take your money, and enjoy themselves. But these men, they did not miss their target. They looked at the spot where Jesus was. That's where they opened. And when they opened, it was straight where Jesus was standing. We saw that they look as wicked people. They appeared as self-centered people. Because we know that ceiling is not a place to enter and you will not get dirty. For them to break the ceiling on top of the head of Jesus will have brought dust on top of his head. And we expected a sharp reaction from Jesus against that poor seed man. But Jesus didn't see all the damages they did to his house. All he saw was their faith. What a different heart. What a different understanding that he had of people and still up to now having towards you and I. Sometimes when people condemn you, he doesn't see you as a condemned criminal. He sees you as a saint, just waiting for time to evolve. And I think it is good for us to study him 
and not just on the cross, even before the cross. Let's see how he brings his life to bear and taught the people of his days the kind of life he possessed, the kind of ministry he came to execute, the kind of message which the Lord God sent him with so that we may take full advantage of what Christ offers us even now in this meeting. Now you realize that as soon as they let down that man before him, he never questioned the man, why did you do this to me? If you need my attention, you shouldn't break my house. If you need my help, you shouldn't damage my house. That's not a good way to seek my attention. Somebody wants to get my attention and he goes to my car and he broke the windscreen so that I can come and help him. Excuse me, will he get help? Um, most likely not. But Jesus was not like that. He looked at the man and he said, Son, that raised my curiosity a little. Because I wonder in my heart, how could he call him son? When did he give back to him? Where did he meet him? What qualified this paralyzed man to be called a son? This man was an accomplice. He didn't even tell his friend not to break the house of Jesus. He didn't caution them. No apologies for the damages they have done to the house of Jesus. And yet the first name that Jesus called him was son. In you is my gene. In you is my life. In you is my nature actually born of the same parents. And I thought about that. And I wondered in my heart, if God will ever help me now to understand how much he loves me. I don't know how the Lord could help my very shallow mind to comprehend how Christ sees me and how he sees you. I wish the Lord in this place and in this meeting, we bring us to that point where we could see clearly that it is not what men call you that he calls you. And it is not how men see you that he sees you. And I'm not by this corroborating the wrong teaching about eternal security. That's not what I'm talking about here. But there is a need for me to let you know that the kind, the depth of his love, the height of his mercy seem too much for human mind to comprehend. And that's why we have not appropriated what God has done for us or what God offers us the way we should such that we could also bring the whole world to the same knowledge with us. As Jesus called him son, I imagine that the fear of what consequences he will likely face for damaging the house of Jesus disappeared immediately. The hope of receiving help that day flooded his heart immediately. He was no longer seeing himself as a criminal. He has seen himself as a son who has right to his father and who has only come to take what belonged to him from his father. But 
as he called him son, I noticed that Jesus did not hide the fact that that man was a sinner, even though he's son. He did not take his eyes away from the fact that he does not only have one sin, but he had many sins. Thy sins be forgiven thee. No matter how much you have hidden your sins, I can tell you that the prying eyes of Christ could see it. Your confession is not what makes him to know that you are a sinner. Without confessing your sins, he knows. I must tell you that your confession of sin is not what brings forgiveness. It only activates it. He is ever willing to forgive. But you need to activate that. But I'm not talking about that yet. What I want to discuss first and foremost this evening is the supremacy of mercy over workplace, over sacrifice. The kind of power the kind of advantage made available so freely in mercy that sacrifice cannot produce. Whether you come to the altar to confess your sins or not, he knows. But it is your prerogative to tell him what he knows. It is a mark of honor unto him to tell him what he already knows. Say, Lord, even without telling you, you know. You know I'm a fornicator. You know how I've aborted many times. You know that I'm a liar. You know it, that I could lie about anything. You know it. That's who I am. I'm simply admitting before you the kind of person I am. That is not an information to him. He knows before you tell him. And this man, without confessing his sin, Jesus went straight to that point. Thy sins. Not your friends. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And I told you in the morning, that looks more like a recommendation. Looking at it in Yoruba Bible, Yoruba language, not just like, I don't know how Bishop Ajayi Crowder interpreted that verse in the Yoruba Bible, but thy sins be forgiven thee. As a Yoruba man, I just know that will be Kia Dari Just like Thy kingdom come. And I wonder in my heart, a son, yet a sinner. So, what makes him different from a slave? Therefore, if he is a son, and yet a sinner, Calling him a son, I wonder in my heart, was it a deceit? Was it a camouflage? Was that to psych the man up? Did Jesus mean exactly that? Could he have called a sinner a son? What makes him a son? If up until that time he was living in sin, why not a slave? Or why not to be mild 
a prodigal son. But do you know that even the prodigal son, while he was living in riotous living, in the heart of his father was still a son. Even though he had joined himself with a strange man. The name is still retained for him. Even though where he was, nobody will call him a son. But one day, the Bible says when he came to his senses, and I say, oh, now I know that when a man who is a son, when a woman who is a daughter walks away from the father, and start to live differently. It is just a moment of insanity. Even though a son. It's just a moment of madness. Even though a daughter. Whereas nobody can remove the fact that this mad person is a son. But no father we desire to identify with him in that state. When we are growing up, ever before we knew Lagos, they used to tell us, that a madman has no mother in Lagos. Now when you see somebody who is mad, is mad at looking for money. Is mad at looking for fame. Legosians told us way back that's a motherless person. That if you think about your mother, you will not be aggressive in the pursuit of making money. That if you don't get mad in Lagos, and actually break connection with your parents, you will never make it. I don't know how far that is true. I have not lived in Lagos. But I am bringing a very simple matter before you tonight. That why this Paul Sigman was living in sin, which I suspect strongly gave the devil a chance to strike him with paralysis. Jesus was waiting for him to return home. He couldn't be called son while he was living in sin. But the truth of the matter is every man came from God. The devil manufactured none. I wonder in my heart, how long are you going to be regarded as a mad fellow? When are you going to come back to your senses? When are you going to recover from your insanity? Oh, son, now prodigal. Oh, daughter, when are you going to come back to your senses and say, look, why am I wasting away here? Even servants of my father, they have enough and more than enough. I will arise and go to my father. I know that the way I am living now, I am not worthy to be called a son. If you just make me one of your hired servants, that will be all right. But I, I was so shocked that as that boy was coming back, he had not even moved close to the house. The father saw him. He ran to go and meet him. It looks to me as if since that boy walked away, every morning the father will come and sit on the balcony, looking straight into the street, expecting his son to emerge. Ever waiting. Even though that son was dead, yet he remained his son. 
if he died in his sin, he will go to hell. It will be a son in hell. I don't know whether you have read the story of the rich man and Lazarus. As the rich man was in torment in hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And he said to Abraham, Father Abraham, will you please send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue? For I am in torment where I am. When he called Abraham father, I was surprised. I felt, how dare you call Abraham father? I was much more surprised when Abraham replied and said, son, when you are in the world. So I said, my God, so he is a son, and yet in hell. Don't believe the teaching of eternal security. You can be a son and go to hell. It's a lie of the devil. That sin meant nothing. Go on and commit sin. There is nothing like that. It's a sin against the flesh and not against the spirit. No, there is no Bible like that. Except you have written your own. The little pages I have read through in my few years of walking with God, I have not found it so. But actually, I am not here to join issues with those who propound such theory. That's not my intention here this evening. My intention is to give mercy. If the law will so permit me, it's correct rating in your heart that you may know that above sacrifice is mercy. That greater than the temple is Christ Jesus. That the sacrifices in the temple cannot be compared with Christ, even without his death. Even when he has not died, you cannot compare Jesus with all the sacrifices going on in the temple. And I desire that God, in his mercy, will bring us into that so that we can see beyond the veil and understand what privileges that belong to us, what victory that belong to us in Christ Jesus. But my challenge for us is, when are you going to recover from your insanity? How long are you going to keep embarrassing your father? That people will look at you and say, but we think you are a son to that good man. And then you say, well, well, and, uh, and. Uh, I said, what is it? Are you not his son? We know his sons. They don't behave this way. Why are you different? Why are you a man like Esau? Different in the lineage of Abraham. Joseph told his brothers, when you go for visa interview in the palace of Pharaoh, I know one question he will likely ask you. He will ask you, what is your occupation? Don't lie. Because you want visa. Tell him, we are shepherds. Our fathers are shepherds. Our grandfathers were shepherds. Our great-grandfather, we have been shepherds all our lives. But was Esau a shepherd? You are not answering me. Who was Esau? He was an hunter. And I wonder in my heart, where did he catch that? Who gave him the ministry of hunting? From whom did he learn that? Why was he a different man? 
in the family of his parents. Why did he choose to kill animals when in the family lineage they keep animals? Young man, why are you different among the children of our father? Young woman, why are you different among the daughters of our father? Why have you brought shame to our family? Somebody told you you can go on sinning. It doesn't matter. You are a star, but a bad star. Do you understand that? Bastard means a bad star. It's a star, but a star that is what? That is bad. A son, but a prodigal one. A daughter, but a prodigal one. We cannot deny the fact that you belong to our family, but we are a different species. You know, it became unfortunate for Esau. He couldn't share the covenant of Abraham. It was a complete loss for him. It was a complete disaster for Esau. Even though the son of Jacob, but he couldn't be regarded as one because he chose a profession that was different from his parents. He chose to live a life that was opposite the life of his family lineage. So, when are you going to recover from your self-inflicted insanity? When are you going to drop this madness of yours? Whatever it is, displayed in your life and yet cannot be found in the first bond of the family makes you a bad star. And there is no doubt if you die in it just like we found a son in hell you might also end up there. But that will never be your portion in the name of Jesus. But it's a challenge that this man was a son. And yet, overtaken in sin. He was a son. And yet, a vagabond. He was a son. And yet, a fugitive. He was a son. Yet, sleeping under the bridges everywhere. He was a son. He kept company of slaves and he lived like them. It's so challenging for me as I read the scriptures the kind of trouble we give to Jesus. He wouldn't deny the fact that he is a son and yet full of sin. How does he combine the two together? He couldn't deny that we are his children and yet full of immorality. He couldn't deny that you are his daughter and yet overtaken in pornography. And the devil comes back and says, look, is that not your daughter? He said, yes. She is. He said, I'm so sorry for you. You don't have any more sin love more. Okay, they being come back. Olum Bima. That a bush rat has given back to ingredient or soup. He claims that he have children. Children or ingredient of soup. Oma being come back. Are these what you call sons and daughters? Is this in the family lineage? Jesus said, no. 
It's not. We're just waiting for when he will return home. We're just waiting for when he will come back to his senses. We're just waiting when he will realize that he's wasting away where he is and that his seat is still vacant in the house. Nobody has taken over his seat in the house. His name is still in the family record. We will keep it until he dies. If he dies without returning home, we will expunge his name. He's never a member of this family. I will say to him at that time, I never knew you. But as long as he's alive, we'll keep waiting until he comes back to his senses and returns to his father. Beloved, I wish God this evening could just bring an understanding to your heart of how he bleeds because of your inconsistent life. You took a walk and you walked away. You feel because you have something in your hand you don't need the fathers and you don't need the elders anymore. No. No. That's not how to live. And that's not how to demonstrate sonship. That would be a strange way of showing that you are a son of this father that we're talking about. Jesus, call him son. Thy sins. Without you telling me, I know that you are full of sins. But as a son, we don't wait for sacrifices that you are going to make. Is it top lady that wrote, Rock of Ages, cleared for me? Of Franny Crosby. Who wrote it? Eh? Are you sure? Okay. If you say it's Franny Crosby. I think one of the lyrics said, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Even if my tears no respite, no. Say, cannot atone for my sin. Oso mu ti mo mu wa mo romo agbelebu mo wa ko da shobo mi It's not a sacrifice that I can make. It's only him with the capacity to say. My challenge tonight is when will you recover from this insanity? When will you choose to live like a son of this father? 
When will you choose to live like a daughter of this father? The boy was insane in the record of the father. Two things were written against his name. Lost and dead. He told the elder brother when he was angry that a feast was thrown at the return of this boy. He said, this is your brother was lost and is found. This your brother was dead but is alive. Don't talk to me about eternal security. When you go into sin, you die. When you go into sin, you are lost. I see him sitting on the balcony of love and his eyes of mercy looking straight towards your direction saying, if you return, I won't call you those names you want to call yourself. I will only call you by the name that I have called you. Son, as though to welcome him home. What a Jesus we have. He combines so many offices. Our brother, yet our father. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. It is not because they climbed the roof. It is not because they broke the ceiling. It is not those efforts that steers his heart to forgive. It's about who he is. And I assure you tonight, if you will come to him, he will not do anything less. I was waiting for the father to say, so how much is in your bank account now? He said nothing. You see, you see, you see yourself. Before I can admit you back into this house, raise that money back. But he didn't say so. I think we misunderstand Jesus. By the gospel that people preach today. We misunderstand him completely. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Even the pool of Bethsaida. I've had time to study waters and rivers in the Bible. Sat down and checked through the Bible. Just studying rivers. And one of those Rivers that touched me was this pool of Bethesda, of Bethsaida. That this Paul Sigmund, 38 years, sat there and I asked, why? Because he knew that if he should step into that pool, he would be made whole of his infirmity. I didn't understand the gravity of that until Jesus met him and told him, don't sin anymore. Let something worse come unto thee. So I know that sin attracts nothing good except everything worse. So I understood that it was sin that brought his paralysis. And yet for 38 years, he kept those sins unconfessed. And he was so certain in his heart that that pool 
will not discriminate against him because of his sins. But greater than that pool was Jesus. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. These scribes, these writers, these hungry authors, these emergency preachers, these preachers who have never developed the heart of Jesus before they come into ministry, they say, who is this that speaketh blasphemies? So the message of mercy has become blasphemy. If you don't understand it, why not keep your mouth shut? If you are confused about it, why don't you just wait until the cloud of confusion over your head disperses while running your mouth? What blasphemy! And Jesus saw in his spirit the imagination of these hungry authors. These men that publish unfermented messages because they are just looking for money and relevance where there is none. He asked them, which one is easier? To say thy sins be forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Which one is easier? Even me, I'm wondering which one is easier. Which one is heavier among the two? To say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say rise, take up your bed, and walk. Which one is heavier? And Jesus looked at them and said, that you may know that the Son of Man has power. Where? On earth. Right here. As we converged in the main auditorium of Quara Baptist Conference, Gomer in learning here, that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. He said unto the Paul seed, so it occurred to me that to say thy sin be forgiven thee is heavier. So that you may know that even the heavier parts I have capacity to handle. Let me just show you the small part of it. Take up your bed and go. Look, I know some sicknesses who defy medical science. But I also know that some will be treated medically and you'll be all right. I have medical experts here. I don't know whether there is medication for sin. Eh? Chichi, is there one? Where is Abayomi? He has been a doctor for some years now. Maybe he has discovered one. There is no medication for sin. If it's headache, if I pray for you and your headache does not go, go and take Panadol. <laughs> Abi, Panadol will handle it. But sin, handle liver salt, apply or kainotobu, You understand my proverb? In Utobu, a pandu liba sort of There is a challenge, and it's a challenge of sin. 
The paralysis of this man was because of sin. And when sin was taken out of the way, the man got up and he walked in their very presence. And they were dazed. They said, we have never seen this on this fashion. Even though I'm not sure whether I can push into Matthew right now to check for this issue that God is raising here by his spirit appear very critical in my heart. And it is not as if we have not made altar calls here since we arrived this place. But I see that God is still saying, when will your insanity leave you? When will you stop being a disgrace to this great family of God? When will you cease being a different species in the family of Jesus? When will you return home? When will you allow reason to prevail? When will you make the grace of God to count in your life? When will you stop allowing mercy to just look like a mere erosion flowing through your path and yet doing nothing in your life. Don't you think you should return home? Those men said this is not the fashion that we know. What fashion do they know? It's a fashion of sacrifice. I told you in the morning or yesterday in the opening charge as we look at John chapter 5 that there was a sheep market. That market, they don't sell anything there except sheep. And it's all, always a booming market. People will come from different parts of the world. And they know that nobody comes to that feast without a sin in his life. And they must come to buy sheep. To slaughter. That's the part they know. And even that, the blood of the sheep does not remove sin. It covers it just for a moment. But that a man could be forgiven his sin and he could be healed of the paralysis that sin brought into his life was a strange occurrence. They have never seen it like that before. May God use your life as an experiment that we taste the world. May you do something spectacular in your life that men have not seen before. May he use your life to set a new record. May he make you a good reference point in life in the name of Jesus. He said we have never seen it this way. Nobody can do this except God. 
maybe we should enter into Matthew. Do you think we should enter into Matthew? Chapter 9. The Gospel of Jesus according to St. Matthew, chapter number 9. The theme of this meeting is atone. What is it? What is the theme, please? Atone. We have a new tone. We have a new fashion. From verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Who was Matthew, please? Who was Matthew? I know he's a task collector. Eh? He's a custom officer. His own department is to collect dues, duty. That is his unit. But he's a custom officer. Do you have any custom officer as brother or as friend? Eh? Do you? What do you think about custom officers, even in Nigeria? What did you call them? They are thieves. Thou said so. <laughs> People, even in this country, don't like custom officers. They believe that they are corrupt. But I can assure you that not all of them But in Israel, too, not only in Nigeria, in Israel, too, nobody gave them any chance because they are regarded as very corrupt. Corruption with not that number. These are pathologically corrupt. Deep-seated corruption. And Jesus saw him and said, follow me. And he arose and followed him. I don't want to say what came into my heart as I read this place. I think I should just leave it that way. Follow me. And Matthew stood up and he followed. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Maybe I should ask you whose house? Matthew's house. This is one of the scriptures that gave me serious trouble years back. I felt, Lord, I cannot accept this. I will accept other things, but this one, I won't. How do I know that somebody collect bribe every time. And then I will go to his house. He will offer me pounded yam, I will eat. And wine, I will eat. And give me gifts, and I will collect it. When I know he's a corrupt person.
Those who are very close to me, they know. They know that if you bring offering, and I know you are not living right, I will say, tell you to take your offering off and go away. I do it regularly. It doesn't, it doesn't cost me anything. That's my heart. I'll just tell you, sorry, not your money, but your heart. I'm not looking for your money. I'm looking for your heart. Give your heart to Christ. And then you can give your money. But Jesus went there. And I have colleagues. I have some family members there too. Who came there. He was eating with these custom officers and sinners. There was no saint, not one. And when the Pharisees saw it, those are my family members. They said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? I want to ask, what were they doing there? Shouldn't we ask? Excuse me. Shouldn't we ask? Or could they have been sitting at... Was, was, that, was that event live streamed? See hypocrites. They too came there. And you can guess, they were also eating. They take their chair very far. But the food came from the same kitchen. They said, well, so that it will not become stained and uh, contaminated. Let's take our chairs to the extreme of the hall. So, they form a circle. And they were eating. But my Lord sat in the midst of these publicans, in the midst of this sinner. In fact, I imagine him asking that they should not serve his food separately. So put Matthew and my food together. We'll be eating from the same plate. And then those Pharisees, they will also eat from the distance. They beckon. I wonder who they will have called among the disciples. Maybe Thomas. He said, we know you are very, very logical in your reasoning. And you are a very good psychologist. Do you think it is correct for your master to be eating with publicans like this match. Human beings, not human rights. It's not easy to cook beans, you know. It takes time to cook beans before it is done. So that's why we are called human beings, not human rights. What they were condemning Jesus for, they were doing in a corner. Excuse me. The sin comes into a man by body contact. Is sin physical? Is sin Residing on the table? No. It's in the nature. And can you read that Bible for me? Let's hear the response of mercy. When Jesus heard that, now, wait, wait now. It's not a subject. But 
everything about Jesus for me is a lesson. In Mark chapter 2, did anybody tell him what those Christ were thinking about? You are not answering me. No. How did he know? He perceived it in his spirit. This one, did he perceive it in his spirit? Eh? He heard. Whoever those Pharisees spoke with came to tell Jesus what they said. Don't be too spiritual. It is not everything the Holy Spirit will tell you. There are some things that men will have to tell you. And it is not everything the Holy Spirit should tell us, even as leaders. He said, well, I expect the Holy Spirit to have told you. We are not Holy Spirit. There are some you have to tell us yourself. We may not know. And he said, well, they are not praying for us. Is they don't, don't, don't they have the Holy Spirit? We do. We do. But there are moments when it is not the Holy Spirit that must pass the information. You must come and inform us. Is that all right? Have I passed an instruction? All right. Brother, can you go on now? He said unto them, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician. Excuse me. What is the meaning of whole? W-H-O-L-E. L-V. Yes. Is that all? Complete. Eh? What did you say? Total. All under. Whole number complete. So, who is Jesus looking for? Eh? The incomplete. Who is Jesus looking for, please? The one that is not total? The one that is in pieces? I was sharing an experience I had many years ago in OAU where I went to preach. There was a small playlet. That playlet affected me so deeply that I cannot forget. That there was this man who was a porter who makes pot of clay. It was the issue of baptism that brought me there. I was sharing our Bible study why God committed an error, please permit me, in making the man of clay and not putting him in the oven to fire him. I told them I remember that while I was in primary school, we used to do hand work. And so I went to collect clay. I made something, and I was on drying in it. And I forgot it there. Rain fell, scattered the whole thing. It was painful because I had to carry it to school the following day. There was nothing to carry. I cried. And I wonder why that should happen. But because as I was growing up in those days, the pot we use into which we fetch water is made of clay. The pot my mother uses or used to cook soup is of clay. We call it tishasu. And I wash it and it doesn't dissolve. Why should this one dissolve? And so they told me, 
that it is because it was not fired. That if I wanted it to retain that shape, I should burn it inside fire. It will no longer dissolve. And that when God made man using the dogs, using clay, he didn't fire him. Because he knew something was going to happen to him. It was, as it were, a bad technology. But it was very deliberate. So I brought that story. That there was this daughter of this man who goes to the river to go and fetch living water with this pot of clay. Bring it to her father to make more pots. And there is this man that is always coming to disturb this lady and telling her that the pot she's carrying is not a good pot. That he has a better pot and it's of iron. He threw his own pot on the ground. Pick it again. He said, you cannot throw your own. He said, look, take this one. This one is durable. He said, no. That's not what my father gave me, to go and fetch the living water. Every day, the man pestered her. He will not, she will not budge. And then, this evil man thought of what to do. and said, let me give her gifts. And then, she was giving a lot of gifts that her hand became so full, she couldn't have hand to hold the pot on her head. And the man put a stumbling block on her path. As she stumbled, there was no hand with which to stabilize the pot on her head. The pot fell and broke into pieces. And the water was lost. She cried. As she was crying, the man came and said, what happened? He said, look, my pot. He said, I told you that this pot is not strong. No, you don't need to cry. Take another one. Look at this one. Threw it again on the ground. And the thing just bounced. Said it's a correct one. And the lady took that. Said, where do I get water now? He said, I have water. From the keg. Not from the river. He poured the water. And the lady went home. As soon as her father saw her, the man screamed. Where did you see this pot? He says, somebody gave me. Where is the pot again? He said, I fell. And it broke. So even this water is smelling. This is not the living water from the river. Where is the pot? He said, he fell. And it broke into pieces. And the man said, go and bring me the pieces. That's why I made it of clay. I will remake it again. That was a message for me. That no matter the extent of the pieces into which you are broken, he will make you again. Look at that Bible. Can you read further for us, brother? They that behold need not a physician. They that behold need not a physician. But they that are sick. But they that are sick. Yes. But go ye and learn what that minute. Now, wait. It was an assignment. Go ye and do what? Learn and what learn that minute. what that minute. What is it, sir? I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What is the meaning of have? And in this context, what does it imply? I will have mercy, not sacrifice. Can you interpret that? I'm not seeing any hand up. What is the meaning of have in this context? I will have mercy. Don't talk about mercy yet. Just have. Yes, brother. I will collect mercy. 
I will receive mercy. I will accept mercy. Not sacrifice. Jesus gave them assignment. He said, go and learn. Go and search the scripture. That what I will collect is what place? Mercy. Not sacrifice. Can you finish that? Have you finished that verse? For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right. Which other part did we read the other time? Matthew chapter what? Chapter 12. Can we come there as we prepare to pray? Brother, yes, sir. are you reading for us again? At that time, yes. Jesus went on, went on the Sabbath day through the corn. I hope you have not forgotten that in chapter 9, he gave them an assignment. Do you remember? Yes, sir. What was the assignment? Go and learn what that, what that minute. I will have what? Mercy. Mercy and not sacrifice. sacrifice. Now go ahead. At that time, yes. Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. All right. And his disciples were an ungard. All right. And began to pluck the hairs of corn. All right. And to heat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, have ye not read what David did when he was an ungard, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Now, I am not going to speak about this now. I will, I will leave it to tomorrow. Greater than the temple will be a matter for us to look at. But read the next verse and hear the Bible. But if ye had known what this minute. Wait, what's the meaning of that? Eh? The assignment he gave them. They didn't do it. They thought he had forgotten. They said, you see, if you have gone to learn what it means when God said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, this matter will not come up again. Can you finish that verse for us now? But if ye had known what this minute, yes, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man now, is Lord, now, wait, even don't on worry, the Sabbath day. Don't worry, we'll read that tomorrow. You can take your seat, sir. Thank you. You see, as we are going to pray, I wonder in my heart, when Jesus Christ said, if you have known that, you will not have condemned the guiltless. Is it that they didn't do what is wrong? Then he came, if he read the next verse, you will hear him say, the son of man is Lord even over Sabbath. Can I announce this to you? That the Son of Man is Lord over all laws you have broken. The Son of Man is Lord over every law you have contravened. And so, because he is the Lord, he is the one to determine 
who is guilty and who is not. If you will come to him today, he will declare you guiltless. Rise to your feet. Look, if the Pharisees are the one that we pass judgment, then we are in trouble. If authors and writers are the one that we pass judgment, then we are in trouble. But the Lord, who is not looking for those who are whole, who is looking for those who have been broken into pieces to gather them together to remake them. He is the one who is here greater than the temple. Greater than all the law you have spawned. Tonight, if you will come to him, he will be willing to accept you. Femi, can you please come and lead us to pray?